Almighty. I'm tossing it into your hands. Praise the Lord. And let's give the Lord a praise offering as she comes Amen. forward. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I just thank God for all of you all. Praise God. I just want to take a minute because I do think it's important to greet you. Like I have said, as you were coming in, I see you, Sister Camille. Um, I see you, Sister Helen. I see you, Sister Sandra. I'm so glad you're here. I see you, Ladybug, Kyrisa. I see you, Sister Cheryl, Sister Shauna, Deacon uh, and Train and Wayne, Sister Denise. And I don't know if Renisha is with you. Minister Andy, my boo, Andy Stupar, <laughs> Sister Sherry, Sister Des, Sister Marva, and of course, last but not least, oh, Brother Prince, I see you there. Elder Fran, Lisa and Yogi, I see you there. But last but not least, my pastor's wife, Minister Jackie, I love you all. If I missed anybody, I did not mean to miss you. It's just these old eyes maybe missing a block. <laughs> All right. Praise God. But I thank God for each and every one of you that are here tonight. God does have a word for the house. I have been studying um, over the course of the last month. God is doing some new things for me. And I just thank God for that. And so um, I do have a word for the church. And as we know, the Bible says that it's important for us to renew our mind. That's how we become Christians. That's how we walk in the walk that we say we believe in because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'm going to open up in a word of prayer, and then I'm just going to go right in. Hallelujah. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for every household that's represented tonight. Father, I ask you to have your way. God, I know what you have put in my spirit. So I thank you, God. Let every word that comes out be the words that you have given me for the body of Christ, God. I thank you for the anointing because the anointing shall break every yoke, Father. You are the ultimate, oh God. You are my first priority, oh God. And so I thank you. I ask you to hide me behind the cross, oh God, and have your way in the mighty name of Jesus. And the people of God say, amen. I can't hear you, but I know you're saying it. Praise God. So praise God. Um, as you know, our pastor has given us a, a theme for the first quarter of the year. Um, and that has been spirit of agreement. And so as I shared with some a little earlier, um, I have been speaking in some different venues. And when pastor gave me the approval to do it, I said to him, so what topic should I pick? And he said, oh, uh, spirit of agreement. So praise God. So I got a lot of stuff. And yeah, I got a lot of pages, but thank God I'm on next week. I'm not gonna tell you how many pages I have. Praise God. Um, but I want this to be interactive. It's Bible study. It's where we learn the word of God to apply to our life so that we can live this thing out. It's not an easy walk. I gave my life to Christ some um, 40 plus years ago, and I'm still doing it. Not an easy walk, but I know his grace is sufficient. I have been able to get through every circumstance. It doesn't mean that there were things that weren't hard. Some of them were, but thank God his grace is still sufficient. What he did back then, he's still doing now. And so I thank him for that. So I'm gonna start by a question because I don't wanna talk all night. This Bible study is for all of us to engage. The Bible says to encourage one another, to inspire one another, to forsake not the assembling of ourselves, right? Because the enemy knows when we talk about spirit of agreement, the enemy knows if we have no church to go to, if we have no power of God to come around to, he knows that that breaks the spirit of agreement with the Holy Spirit, with what the word says. So when people tell you they watch, uh, they watch church on TV, I question that because you're not gonna get power from that. What the word of God says in Hebrews, he says that we should fellowship, do not forsake, the assembling of ourselves. It is important to encourage, inspire, to uplift as the day approaches, because the day is approaching. We just don't know when. So putting our time in, putting our um, focus into the things of God is really key for the building of the power of God to create unity, encouragement, and to bring 
you know, we're here to bring others in, right? Creating disciples. That's what he commissioned us to do. And the enemy would love nothing better but for us to be all messed up on different angles, you know, coming in in different directions, not, you know, hearing what the spirit of God has to say for the church. And so the pastor gave us a scripture and the scripture was from Genesis eleven six, And that scripture was about the Tower of Babel. And so we've talked about that week after week. It's been literally three months. We started in January. And so this part, I want you to use the chat and I see people using it already. Um, <laughs> yeah, Sister Marva, yeah, I count those pages. I want people to use the chat. And I want you to tell me, what do you think are the benefits of spiritual agreement? Now you have been, some of you have been to every single one of these Bible studies since January. Just like when you go to school, just like when you are on a job and you have to learn something, you have to do the same thing in the word of God. The enemy knows that our power comes from our education in what we say we live. If we don't know the word, we can't live it out. We can't invoke the power of God into our lives. So when God says, you know, you're going through something, God says, I'm going to heal you. Having a scripture, being able to even open up the, the word of God. If you haven't memorized it, that's okay. At some point you will, because you'll recognize that your power comes from your knowledge, the renewing of your mind daily in the word of God daily. So that's why I encourage people, young, young people, old people, when people first come into Christ, when you're trying to figure this thing out, you're coming from a lifestyle that maybe might have been alternative. You're coming from a lifestyle of drugs and this and that. It's important to know what the word of God says about your situation so you can invoke the power of God in your life. The enemy does not want you to know that because he knows there is power in the word of God. But if we don't know it, if we have no knowledge of it, we're not able to use it, even in a practical form. Amen. So I want you to use the chat or raise your hand because, again, I'm going to give us like 10 minutes here. What are the benefits of spiritual agreement? And yes, I am one of those. I can wait it out until there are some answers or to some folks um, <laughs> raise their hands. I'm okay with silence. That's okay. Because I want you to get it. We've been talking about this in Sunday service. We have been talking about this week after week. Last week, Elder Fran preached on Lent, the Lenten season. And she talked about how that sort of envelopes into the spirit of agreement, right? Realizing there's a time of reflection. So we can reflect back over the things that God has done for us. So that there's power in that, but understanding that and knowing that, and again, using it and applying it is really important. So what are the benefits of spiritual agreement? And don't make me call you out. Because <laughs> I will pick on you, Sister Sherry. Unmute yourself, my sister. Unmute yourself. You said it, Elder Maji. There's power. In agreement, when two come together. Amen. Two or more. Praise the Lord. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Yes. Hi, Sister Pat. We're on a question right now. Sister Sherry said there's power. When two come together, we're in agreement. Who else? Brother Prince wrote it in the chat. What are the benefits of spiritual agreement? You can either answer it in the chat or you can raise your hands. You can use the reactions. This is a time where we take the word of God very serious. I remember one of those old time preachers, and yes, I'm going to date myself, right? He used to say, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where like it all happens. You can come in for the praise and the worship and all that other stuff, but that's not the stuff that's going to sustain your lifestyle in Christ. What sustains you is the power of God and coming in strategic alignment with him. Evangelist Shauna. Uh, it's, 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 Sister Marge, I was in, you guys see? 
you're going in and out. We can't, we didn't hear one word you said, but Sister Can you Marge, you? sorry, honey. So um, if you could type your response to Sashana, you could probably type it in the chat area, uh, just in case. And I could repeat it for you. Could you just break it up? Continue, Ella Marge. All right. Sister Pat, go ahead. Um, when you're talking about coming in alignment uh, and an agreement, you could, it'll be agreement when two people, when your heart is right. If one person's heart is right and the other one's heart is not right, that's not agreement. You know what I mean? You know, you don't, when you're expecting the power of God, he moves on, on the, um, he moves with his word, but he moves when you have when you don't have anything in your heart. He says, if you have any iniquity in your heart, he won't hear you. So you have to also make sure before you come into a power of agreement, Lord, do I have anything in my heart that I haven't surrendered or anything I'm not aware of? Because we want to see the hand of God move. So Amen. that also to me would be in line with power of agreement. Amen. You know, like we're supposed to examine ourselves and check ourselves regularly, daily. I always ask God to create me a clean heart, renew within me a right spirit and show me any area, show me if I have any wickedness in my heart that I may not be aware of. He may look at it as that way. I may not. So with self-examination, because I'm expecting the hand of God to move Every time I pray, no matter who I'm praying for or whether I'm praying for myself, I want to make sure my heart is right. That's so important to me. So if we're gonna, if you want me to be in agreement with you, I want to make sure that I have that confidence that we are definitely united. I don't know if I'm making sense. You made sense. Thank you, Sister Pat. I think, you know, um, you said it in the beginning, and yes, your explanation is spot on. Um, two are coming together, um, walking in agreement. And one of those Bible studies that I taught, and we talked about this, and I, I, I loved, I think it was the New Living Translation, Sister Camille, tell me if I'm wrong, Amos 3.3, 3, I loved. How can two walk together? unless they agree to walk in the same direction. We have heard that scripture so many times throughout our lives. How can two walk together unless they agree, right? That's the King James version. The New Living Testament is how, to, to, how can two walk together unless they agree to walk in the same direction. So we can be together. We might even agree on something, but we have to agree that we're going in the same direction. And that same agreement has to be the agreement with the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit, the word of God. When we come into, a, so Sister Pat, you said a whole bunch and I'm, and I'm gonna teach in about two minutes, but I love what you said because when we come in alignment to what God has for us or in agreement, as we pray, like you said, and as we do things together, what we're praying aligns with what God has for us, even though we don't know it, as we go deeper and deeper. So you say, God, the desires of my heart are, come on, he already knows the desires of your heart because he created you and knew you in your mother's womb. He knew you were gonna serve him at a certain point. So there was already a pathway set out for you. Now he's saying my daughter or my son, I need to teach you how to hear my voice, know who I am, understand your power and your authority in me so you can walk this walk while you're on this earth, so you can live a good life. You think the enemy wants Christians to feel good about who they are, who they are in Christ, the power they have in Christ? No, he doesn't. He doesn't want us to be happy. He doesn't want our bodies to feel well. He wants to mess with our minds. He wants to mess with our relationships. But God says in Jeremiah 29, know that I have a plan and a purpose for you. Plans of good 
and not of that. That's from God's word. So when we start to move along in this Christian walk and we get sick and things happen, I shared with you all know my the testimony that I'm going through now with my mom and my with her having Alzheimer's and the things that I've been through in the last year, it has not been fun, but I know his grace is sufficient and I will continue to hold on to that. I may not see my mom's healing on this side of the land, but I know he's covering her with the blood of Jesus and I will continually speak over her life, his word over her life. I will continually speak his protection, Psalm 91, every time I'm not with her over her life, just like we do with our children, our loved ones, I will continue to do that and trust and know that that's God's part of the job. My part of the job is to align with what he said. So I continue to pray for her. I continue to seek his face for her. I continue to fast for her. That's my part of the work. And then I've got to let it go. I could keep the burdens on me. I could be heavy about it. And when we first made that separation, when I had to put my mom into a nursing home, that thing ate me alive. I'm her only child. And we had a, we had a discussion. Uh, you know, and he, when she got the disease, we had the discussion. We went to lawyers. We had the discussion. We had a discussion with the family. One thing she didn't want to do is go into the nursing home. But I know that if she didn't have the disease, she would have said, take care of me, just make sure I'm okay. And I can't care for her. I'm not a caretaker of Alzheimer's patients. I can't, she sees me as her daughter. And so there's a lot of this, <laughs> a lot of that. We just like, oh, you know, but I know it's the disease. So I can't do anything about that, but just love on her and pray and walk in faith, knowing that God, walking in agreement with the Holy Spirit, with what he has for my mom's life, his plan and his purpose for her, Amos 3.3. 3. And what I had shared with you when we were talking about Amos 3.3, 3, that was at the time where the prophets were coming forth and God was using them as his mouthpiece. Because each one of us here, we have areas of influence. We have people that are around us. We speak over our family. We speak over our friends, right? So there's power in our tongue, right? The, the negative things we say over people, yes, there's power in that. The positive things we say over people, there's power in that. And we have to believe it. When somebody says, I can't do this and oh, watch, this won't happen for me. You got it. It won't happen for you. Do it, it will work. Don't, and it won't. I love when Reverend Ray used to say that. That is a standard principle in life. You, If you're not even gonna try it, if you're not even gonna count on God to make a change, to do something different for you, if you're not even gonna pray, if you're not even gonna put your kids at his feet, if you're not even gonna say, God, I release it, if you're not even gonna try, well, if you don't try, it won't work. It will not work. And the enemy knows, he knows your heart, he knows your mind. So you've got to believe that God, you said it, you're a man of your word that settles it, I'm moving on. Even when you see it, I saw it with Sister Raleen with her headaches and I'm not saying the migraines are gone, but I know I went through that, right? But I believe in God's word. I told you my head felt like it was splitting at that time, several years ago. Every time I would come into the church, I could barely open my eyes. I knew it was the enemy. When I went to the hospital, they thought I was having a heart attack. They said, it doesn't make sense. Like, I, we don't know what's wrong with you. You're not having a heart attack, but your vitals are like you're having a heart attack. Well, I know it's an attack from the enemy. I'm not going to tell them that. I'm like, God, if you don't do it, no one else can. No doctor can figure this out. No medication can heal me. The, the, they gave me some of these little droplets for my brain. I'm like, I'm not even taking those. <laughs> like, sorry. Like, I don't even want to start that. If God can't do it, then nobody can. Now, I'm not telling people not to use medication or anything like that. You've got to do what you've got to do. 
Just like when we go into the hospital and we're injured, they give us, you know, IV fluid and all, you got to do what you got, take care of yourself. But what I'm saying is if you have that level of faith, if you believe, if you're walking in faith, in the spirit of agreement with God's word, God, you said faith is the substance of something hoped for and the evidence of something I can't see. So you cannot see it with your spiritual eye. You cannot, you will not be able to see it with your spiritual eye, with your natural eye. I'm sorry, your natural eye. You can see it with your spiritual eye because you look into the spirit and you say, God, you said you'd heal me. God, you said you'd save my family. God, you said you'd restore me. God, you said you'd take this anger away from me. You take this depression and this anxiety. What do I need to do to shake this off? Deliver me and heal me now because you said it. And sometimes God can heal you divinely. And sometimes it's a process. And when we go through the process, we learn of God's grace, which is sufficient. And that is what the enemy does not want the people of God to know, that there is power in that. And so when we talk about the spirit of agreement and we talk about walking in one of cord, we've got to be walking in the direction with the Holy Spirit. That's just like when you come into relationship with people whether it's a, you know, somebody that you're, you're significant of, a fiance, lover, boy, whatever, you're coming into agreement with this is what we're going to do. But both parties have to agree that this is the direction we're walking in. And if you don't have that agreement, you don't have that agreement. And then, then there's the disunity and there's power in the disunity. Praise God. Praise God. I see your comments, Sister Sandra. I'm going to come back to that. Praise God. Elder Margie. Yes. Um, I think uh, Sister Shauna had came back on with a different device. So um, I don't know if she has her response still. Okay. Evangelist Shauna, are you there? I don't oh, see you. Her. Yeah, she Galaxy in nine. I think she was just here. Um, so we could come back to that if she stepped away. Yep. So the power of agreement is, it's huge. Now I'm going to go to the chat. I see Sister Sandra's comments. She says, sorry if this is our topic. I just wanted to say I understand what you're saying because since I started my walk with God, I have been having some crazy dreams. But when I wake up, I just listen to worship music or read my Bible. Amen, Sister Sandra. That's what you need to do. And as you have those dreams before you go to bed, you pray over yourself. You tell God to come into your dreams. Ask the Holy Spirit to take full control. And if there's a message from those dreams, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what it is. As you, you know, lay yourself down, the enemy, he does try to confuse us, but you belong to God now. I don't know when you gave your life to Christ, but you know, uh, how long you've been in him, but you belong to him. Your old life is gone. And now you're in a new life. You're a new person. The Bible says everything is passed away and everything becomes, all things become new in him. So that walking in, and that is the spirit of agreement, Sister Sandra, walking in what God has for you. Like you said, since you gave your life to Christ, you think the enemy wants you to live this life out and he's happy that you're saved now because you probably can. Each one of us, we have people around us that look at our lives. You can touch the lives of other people and show people that your life in Christ is something. It's all that. And that God can do the impossible. Again, I don't know how long you've been saved. You can have testimonies of the things that God has done for you. So really important is Evangelist Shonda, Shonda back on. Yes. Evangelist Shauna, do you want to make your comment? And then I'm going to go into the lesson. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was, I was just, I was going to say, um, this morning I was doing, um, my studies and I was in the book of Luke and I, you know, I was reading how 
um, Christ, how he chose his 12 disciples. And I was reading all the miracles that, that um, Christ was doing along the way with his disciples beside him. And I'm like, oh my God, look at that. I'm like, it just hit me. The spirit of agreement just hit me because I was saying if those 12 disciples was not in agreement with Christ, what would have happened? You know, he chose those disciples and he, and they were walking along with him. So they were, they were all in agreement. He was there with them. And I, I, the spirit of agreement just give me, a, a just it just hit me in the face like that. And I'm like, oh my God, one can chase a thousand, two can chase 10,000. I said, do you know the amount of, of power I mean, Christ is all powerful already, but one can chase a thousand. I'm like, there was a lot of power, a lot of added power there with the 12 disciples. And I'm like, everybody was on one mind, one accord. And then that led me on thinking about, um, because we have to think about um, the enemy and, 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 the, and, and, and the devil's camp. And we have to think about, oh, Nothing that comes from the devil, nothing that comes from the L is in disarray. The enemy and his boys are together, okay? <laughs> they do everything together. They're on one mind when he sends them out, when he sends his troop out to do whatever they, they are. If, if, go to Sister Marjorie's house, go over there. They're on one mind one accord and I'm like oh my god if the enemy and his boys can be on one mind god why can't we be on one mind and we are children of god amen and it's it's it just hit me this morning with the 12 disciples I'm like oh my god that was all power right there yeah. that was what I that's good I I love that evangelist Sean I think I didn't write that down, but something that it was impressed on me when um, what you were talking about specifically with the disciples is when Jesus, what, you know, because as we've been reflecting, as Elder Fran has been teaching us, right, and I've been looking at like the communion and how he said, you know, do this in remembrance of me and he had all the disciples lined up there. That again, spirit of agreement, everybody was willing to do that because they loved the father so much. They didn't want him to go, right? And so he said, do this in remembrance of me every time, you know, whatever that cadence is of how you do it, but take this, take this bread and take this juice in remembrance of me and reflect on who I am and the power I have and what I can do for you. So I, I agree with you. Um, it's powerful when we learn, again, when we learn from biblical situations, the principles in the Bible. So really important. I'm going to take one last. I see Sister Des is, um, when I think of the spirit of agreement, I think of answers, obedience, trusting, and unselfish. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yes, my sister. Come on now. Spirit of agree uh, agreement means that you are a walking in alignment with what Christ has for you. So he is going to give you answers, but you need to be obedient because again, you don't, the enemy can take you off your track, throw you in a different direction because instead of doing this, you're doing that. And right, he's going to make it real, whatever it is, whether you're you know, I gave the example, I don't know when I did, but anyway, whether you're doing something that you know you're not supposed to be doing, let's say in your former life, life you were a thief and now you're at the store and you're, you're kind of like, oh, let me just slip this into my pocket again, right? Mm -mm. That's not where God would want you to go. You know, Christ doesn't want you to do that. The spirit, the spirit of God convicts you immediately, right? Whether we're going to a house that we're not supposed to be going to, or calling somebody at a certain hour because they're going to come over to the house, right? You know the spirit of agreement is not that. You're, you're subjecting the Holy Spirit to a place that he doesn't want to be, to a situation that he doesn't want to be in. So you're forcing the Holy Spirit to do something, to be somewhere he doesn't want to be because he lives in you. 
So I love that, Sister Des. And you said one more. I got to read that last one. What was the last one? Um, trusting and unselfish. Yes, trust. My favorite scripture, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Again, that was one of my scriptures as a younger person because I had to build my trust in him. Trust in the Lord with all my heart. Don't lean onto my own understanding because my mind and the way I think is not like Christ. Although I'm trying to align with him, it's not. I'm going to think like Margie until I say, Holy Spirit, you take over. But in everything I do, everything, not some, not a few, not the things that relate to the church, everything I do, acknowledge him and he will direct me. So if he's the director, my, when I pray, when I ask God to do something, I am now aligning with him, like Sister Des said, because I'm not, I'm being unselfish. I'm saying, God, you show me. And sometimes, you know, <laughs> we have those pity potties and those tantrums. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, in going through some things in my life, there were times where I'm like, nope, nope, God, no, no, I am not, not yet. I am not doing that. Don't want to do it. I am not feeling it. Well, when the Holy Spirit deals with you, because you say you are truly his, he knows how to, he knows how to touch you and, and go tap, 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 just like we do with our kids, right? <laughs> a little tap here, a little, really girl, you, you're really not going to do that. I told you to do something. I told you to give that person money or whatever it is. I told you to give that person a ride. You're not. And then the Holy Spirit will convict you because again, if you're really, truly godly, sorry, God, I'm sorry. I repent of that. I want you to show me how to align and how to agree with what you have for me. And when you recognize your purpose, and when you recognize your gifts, and when you recognize why he put you in somebody's life, you got to get it together. I remember mentioning to Andy, you know, I had made friends with somebody, I don't even know who it was a while ago. And I was like, man, I, I'm just not feeling this. Like, I'm so tired. I can't, I can't, I can't. And my husband's like, it's not for you. It's, it's what God, God has put these people in your life whether it's a person or a situation, it's for God to get the glory. It's not for you. And when we remember that, that's the alignment piece. It's not for me. And I had to repent and say, God, forgive me. Like I gotta help me, but God, forgive me, but give me patience, give me whatever it is that I need to be there in the situation present for the person so they get what they need from you because you put us here not to be an island by ourselves but so that others can so we can encourage one another we can fellowship with one another we can uplift one another because the enemy he goes around seeking who he may devour and i remember one of the stories that um my family likes those, you know, um, geographic stories about animals. And, and, you know, they were talking about lions and how they act. And that's what they do. They wait for their prey and they wait for you to be alone. They don't, they don't go after a whole, I mean, if there's a whole tribe of them, but it's one at a time. And that's what the enemy does. One Christian at a time. Let me wait when she's her, she or he are their weakest and they have no strength and let me come at them. And now they're in their natural. They have nobody praying for them. They have nobody surrounding them. They have nobody supporting them. They feel alone. They don't wanna go back to the church. They say the church is a hypocrite. They're hypocrites or whatever, right? All the reasons and excuses people come up with to not be part of a local body because again, the enemy devises it that way because he understands the power in the local body. He understands it better than we do as Christians. That is why he does what he does to separate us, to make us 
not unify. All right, so I'm gonna go into what I actually wrote down. Amen, Sister Marva, no man is an island. We're not, but many people I feel sometimes feel that way or they feel alone or they feel like hurt. I mean, I, again, I've been in the church a long time. I know what that feels like. Somebody may have done something to you and they may not have apologized and they may continue to do it. And until you address it or until you, know, you go to God first and there's a way to address that. God gives us his word, there's, there's, there's instruction for everything we do in our life in the Bible. You just got to figure, you know, go to it. And if you're not sure where it is, that's why God gives you pastors. That's why God gives you teachers and evangelists and preachers, because they can help you find that. But God wants you to put your eyes on it for yourself, understand it, meditate on it. God, show me, talk to me, listen to your, you know, um, programs on YouTube or whatever, so you can understand the word of God. As long as it's the unadulterated word of God coming from a man or a woman of God that understands the word, it's the word. And so God gives those gifts to the church so that we can understand who we are. Hallelujah. All right. So I'm going to go into my notes here. So thank you. That spiritual agreement, I think, again, we come week after week. So it's, it's important to know how to apply what we say we live. And if we're not taking, just like when we go to school, one of the things I learned very early on in my Christian walk, and again, being Pentecostal, right? <laughs> Most of us that had started off in this church, I came from the Church of the Holy Ghost, and then my parents did this church. But we always had our notebooks in service, always. That was like a requirement. There was no, it was like you go to school, you bring your notebooks, your pencils and your backpack and your lunch. <laughs> and so the same with, you know, we in church, we bring our, I bring my snacks. Okay, I'm guilty. So I always have snacks in my bag with my, um, with my notebook, right? Pen and paper, because there's something in that service that God has for me, even if I'm only writing one line. Most of the time, <laughs> Sister Camille, oh yeah, I forgot, right? Now we got any, any uh, madness of iPhones and iPads and tablets and Blackberries. I can't leave my husband out, right? The last Blackberry on the earth, he will keep that, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, right? We take our notes because it's important for us to put our eyes on the word of God when we need to encourage ourselves. The word of God says, right? We have to encourage ourselves. We can get encouragement from other people. That's good. But again, the enemy knows we have to encourage ourselves. So knowing how, when I'm going through some things I, and it's you know related to maybe a sickness or whatever, I pull out my healing scriptures, right? And I stand on God's word. It doesn't mean that I'm not feeling a certain way or a certain thing, but I'm gonna speak God's word over me because I believe it. And that settles it. I'm not going to waver. I don't have time for that, right? It's important to move on and let God do his part. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about unity. Hold on one second. Let me I have to minimize this in order to read my notes. Sorry. <laughs> so Brother Prince, if somebody, because I'm not looking at everybody, if somebody has a question, you're gonna to have to interrupt me or anything that you want me to read in the chat. So when we think about spiritual agreement and we, when we think about st the strategic importance of it, we think about agreements like we have with our families, right? The importance of success to any situation, any organization, any family, any church, any um, sports team, um, recognizing this is important for you to, in order for you to function well in life. A woman and a man come together, they get married, agreement. There has to be agreement. When you are running your household, whether you're a single mom, um, whether you know it's um, mom and dad, agreement. There has to be agreement. And so we see in Genesis 1, and I wanna read that. Um, actually, I wrote it down. 
So Genesis, turn with me to Genesis 1, 26. This is where God is decreeing something. Um, God is decreeing. He says, let us make man in our image, which is unmistakably plural. And I wrote this because as I was looking this up and I wrote about the pluralness, um, a lot of, sometimes when I go to the Hebrew body, um, Bible, I just wanna see what that Hebrew word is like or it sounds like. And so in this case, the word, um, let us make man in his image. Um, it means that us, obviously the plural, meaning the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see this happen in Genesis, right? So in the beginning, when the Holy Spirit hadn't even been manifested, but God, the father, God, the son existed. And so God speaks of himself, because this is God decreeing, he's speaking of himself as more than one person. And so he's speaking as the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, Genesis 1.26. God is the role model here. He's starting it off for us. The spirit of agreement between the three of them. Let us make man in our image. And so the full Trinity is present here, right? The full creation that he's making, we're gonna make man in our image, we're gonna make the birds, the sea, the water. They came into agreement. Whether it's a contract, like nowadays we have contracts, right? You have a contract with a landlord, you have a contract um, maybe at school or at work, right? For specific things. If you're a volunteer, you have a contract, you're coming into agreement. And the agreement is that we're gonna do this thing, whatever this thing may be, whatever it is that we're embarking on we're going to do it together and we're going to agree and like amos 3 3 says the new living testament i love that version right we're going to walk in the same direction with the agreement so every good contract contains an implied duty of good faith and fear dealing so like i said a landlord right sports a job right good faith and so good faith means honesty. So when we're dealing with God, we need to be honest because he knows our thoughts, right? When we're dealing, when people call on us or for something that we may have done that doesn't look Christian-like, right? We have to be honest. I had told you I, um, someone had um, decided on working at a job in a place that I, she knew God didn't want her there right? It wasn't a place that gave God glory, right? But kept on coming up with these excuses because I got to pay my bills, because I got to do this. My question to her was, is this in alignment with what God has for you? Do you think God wants you hanging out at the bar, being a bartender to make money for you and your kid? Are you kidding me? And that's when you got to get real with people. Are you kidding me? Does this align with the Holy Spirit? So every whatever days you work, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every four days a week, you're going to walk into this place that is crowded with, you know, when we say a whole bunch of boys, a whole bunch of demons coming in that place, right? <laughs> because, you know, there's liquor, there's drugs, there's whatever, what we call spirits. There's spirits. Spirits are real. You think Jesus Christ wants to hang out in that place? He'll hang there to win people to him, to take them to a better life, but not for the consistency of, I've got to make money for my family. Come on now, you might as well not even come in the name of Jesus Christ with that. Now, I can understand if you're a babe in Christ and you're starting this walk and you don't understand, that's different. But when I hear seasoned saints say this or, People who have been in Christ, mm -mm. you that's, that's just an excuse. And remember what I told you, maybe this was last year, when I talked to you about what excuses are, they're well-planned lies. Because they're excuses. They're not the real thing. You come up with that because you want to validate what you're doing and not agreeing with what Christ has for you. So they're excuses. 
And, you know, somebody debated me when I had said that I had taught, I don't know, it was sometime last year, or maybe even in 2019. I don't even remember when I taught it, but I remember that like this person was really upset um, because they felt like, you know, I was coming at them um, personally. I said, no, the spirit of God does the work. I just, I'm the voice piece. What God gives for me for the church, I'll tell you, you deal with God on that. But for me, that's a well, those are excuses. It's not, you can't, don't try to reason with me. <laughs> Go to your heavenly father and then ask him, Father God, show me. You want me hanging on the pole in the club? You want me behind the bar in a club? God, is that your will for me and my kid? Come on now. God, you want me doing this? You want me doing that? What do you want me to do, Holy Spirit? He will show you. And it does mean, um, Sister Des put it in there, it does mean obedience. Because God's going to tell you, heck no, get up out of there. <laughs> like, get up out of there. What, like, what are you thinking? What do you think? Come on, let's be real as people of God, right? Reasonable. We have a, a certain level of intellect. God gives us, gives that to us. He says his word confounds the wise. Now, I'm not saying we're not wise, right? His word confounds those that consider they're highly educated. But for those of us that are just willing, God, I just want to go to your word and seek your face. And then you show me what you really mean here. He does that. And he uses preachers and teachers to teach you that. But he also uses your own intellect to understand it. You should be renewing your mind daily, reading the word of God, reading devotionals, asking God to show you what he has for you. When something's not clear for me, when I'm, you know, and, and now that I'm this age, when I was that age before, I write everything out. And yeah, maybe I go, I, you know, I like to journal. I, I remember times going back and forth with God. Well, this and that and this and that. What about this, God? No, this is how I see it, God. And then God would, maybe it would be in a service that somebody would be preaching and teaching. And I'm like, oh my God. And it would be just for me personally. I'm like, oof, you sent that message for me. You used that mouthpiece for me. So God has that for the body of Christ. I see some comments in the chat, so I'm going to stop because, again, like I said, <laughs> Sister Marva, you got jokes tonight. Sounds like climbing the rope in gym class. Yes, yes. Come on. That's good. All right. I got to use you as the comedian tonight, Sister Marva. You're, you got some good ones, right? So we have to understand who we are in Christ as we align with his spirit, what he wants us to do. Right. Are there questions before I move on to the rest of my lesson? Okay. All right. So, um, so good faith requires, uh, generally requires honesty, fair dealing, but the spoken word, a vow or a commitment in the Bible is really powerful. So numbers 32. So when you're in, you know, most of you know, I love principles of leadership, right? That's the area that God has um, put me in. I know he has gifted me in that, right? So the leadership stuff is really up my alley. And every time I see stuff, I'm like, ooh, that's good, God. That's good. Accountability, integrity, whatever, whatever those words are, right? So this is where he talks of this for me. In the beginning of the Bible, we're talking accountability, right? So I want you to go to Numbers 32 or write it down. Numbers 32 tells us when a man makes a vow to the Lord, again, spirit of agreement, or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. So we as believers, right, that's the principle, right, the principle of the matter, as my husband would say, right, that's the principle. We should be refrained from committing to something we cannot do or something we say we're gonna do and then we don't keep our promise, right? And I, I, I really, 
I don't want to say the word hate, but I, I feel strongly about when people make a commitment and then they don't follow through. Or as Brother Prince would say, who dropped the ball? That's an inside joke. <laughs> but who dropped the ball up in here? Right? Who dropped the ball? What the heck happened? <laughs> Right, we make a vow to the Lord, we make a pledge. Number 30, numbers 32. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? So what he said back then, it applies now. Now, obviously, you have to understand the context. This was the time where this was the law. We called this part of the Bible the laws, right? And when you did something against the laws, you could be hung, you could be killed. So thank God for the Holy Spirit and thank God for Jesus coming because we don't have to now. We don't have to take a lamb and sacrifice a lamb at the altar. We don't have to do any of that because the Holy Spirit is here for us now. But accountability, we make a pledge, we make an oath, we make, we align with God on something. Okay, God, yeah, I'll help out in the missions ministry. And then they tell you to show up every Friday night at, you know, seven o'clock and you make one. And then the next week you don't call that leader. They're plant, they're, they're counting on you though. And then you don't show up and you don't call who dropped the ball. What happened? Right. Same thing when we're thinking about work. Right. So, and I, you know, I, I manage teams online. Right. And so we talk about stuff like this, right? And I, I do get, I have those who drop the ball moments. And um, I will say to them, you are accountable for this work. It's your work. You are adults. When you are babies, Christ doesn't expect, you know, you're six, seven, or you have a level of not, you know, not understanding. He's not gonna hold you accountable for that. But if you signed up for this thing, and we're paying you and all we're asking you to do X, Y, and Z. Now, again, sometimes people don't have the skill. That's something different. But when you sign up and you say, this is what I am supposed to be doing, that's what you should be doing. And so when the church comes back to me and they start talking like the secular world or our job, I'm like, uh-uh, no, no, no. That is not the word of God. We are not just Christians in church. We are Christians, in fact, outside of church. So they can see the Christ in us. They can see we have integrity. They can see we're accountable. They can see we're responsible. That's what we are. And so when we make that pledge and we make that vow, we are coming into alignment and an agreement with what the Holy Spirit has for us. So as I just read to you, as believers, when we make a promise, and especially I feel very strongly about this with young people, when you tell them you're gonna do something, you've got to do it. Or you go back to them and you explain why. Because each of us know, all of us have been children. And as a child, when somebody disappoints you, that thing takes you into your adulthood if you haven't sorted it out. Now I'm not talking about little things, but kids don't forget. <laughs> and, you know, I joke now, right? I have the two 17 year olds that are getting ready to go to college. And I have the 25 year old who I feel like, thank you, God, we, we did okay with this one, right? But we got the two 17 year olds, we're teaching them a thing or two. And sometimes we have to have that conversation. Like, what did you do? Did you call? Did you even tell them you're not coming? You mean you got somebody waiting for you over somewhere and you're sitting up in here? Are you kidding me? You have a responsibility because you made a commitment to somebody. You made an agreement with them. That's your friend. That's your teacher. That's your whatever. It's the same, right? Those are the principles. And I'm not going to tell my kids, oh, this comes from the Bible. No, that's the principle. Those That leads into leadership. Because when they get out there in the world, that's what they're going to have to deal with. 
And I, I always tell Andy, I'm like, when I see those people <laughs> that I hire and I thought they had something and they come with something else, I'm like, ah, they're still in their childhood. They still have not figured it out yet. And my colleagues say the same thing. And I feel horrible sometimes because that means that something happened along the way where somebody didn't teach them those basic principles. But when you are a child of God, you have become a new creature. The principles are in the Bible. You just have to seek his face. You learn through the renewing of your mind. You learn through the teachers in the church, the preachers in the church. You learn through the word of God. He teaches you yourself when you open up your Bible and you're doing your devotions. There are devotionals out there that guide you through the principles of your life, of your life in Christ and how you should do what you should do. Any questions? Let me see what's in the chat. Thank you, Sister Camille, for putting the, and Sister Kyrisa for putting the scriptures. I think the scriptures are important. They're important so that we can look back and have something to refer to um, when, uh, when we're going through or when we have scenarios or situations. So we have to be, uh, so it's important for us to be um, really prudent about what comes out of our mouth, what, what we're agreeing to, what comes out of these lips, right? What we're saying to other people right, what you're, if you're in ministries, right, aligning with what the pastor, because we know God has put the pastor as the head of the church, the under shepherd who is under Jesus Christ. And so when you're aligning with what the pastor has said, you're aligning with what Jesus Christ has for you. And as long as the pastor is following the Christ, you should be following him. Hey, Elder Marley. Yes. Um, Elder Friend had, has a question. Yes, Elder Fran. Um, I don't know if it's a question, but when when we're in alignment, it, whether you realize it or not, even as you're speaking, it creates order. And when it creates the order, everything falls into place. And and like you said, if if someone drops the ball, then you're only going to be as strong as that weakest link who dropped the ball, it causes a disconnect. Um, so it, it, when when we do things on all on one mind and one accord, it creates an order. So that that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, that's good, Elder Fran. Absolutely. God is a God of order. I love that because again, now referring back to Genesis, that's how he did like the creation in the earth. Every time he did something, he looked back. And he said, oh, this is good, right? Again, it was just God speaking at that time, but he would refer to the three of them. Look what we have done. This is awesome. You know, I'm using our words, but looking back, right? Order in everything that he has done. Again, the alignment, that's a great point, elder friend, the alignment of that. And when somebody does drop the ball, it does create the disunity. It creates the disconnect. But here's the thing, right? God always has a ram in the bush. God's program, whatever God's plan is, it's going to happen. Now, I would hope that the people of God understand that he uses people for the work. He could come down at, at any point. He could just, and things will um, he could just make, you know, a sound and things would open up, but we've got to know that he uses us for a purpose. We have a purpose on this earth. So that's really important to understand that. I'm going to go for about two more minutes. Um, and then I'm going to close it out. Whoops, sorry, wrong notes. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So spiritual agreement is the heart and soul of the church. Acts 4.32, I want you to look that up, involves being of one mind so that we are one just as the Father and Son are one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. This is a lot more than just agreeing on religion or doctrine. This is about the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And I'm going to close with this last comment. Let's read Acts 4.32. Um, this is the time in the Bible where the Holy Spirit was manifesting himself. And boy, was he a power. And he was touching people. People were coming together on one mind, one accord. They were speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Every time Jesus came into the room, there was something powerful going on or something happening. And so Acts 4.32 says, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So the first part of that is one mind, one heart, and one soul. The second part of that was they were sold out for Jesus. They're like, God, we'll give you all our possessions. We don't want these. Whatever, the Holy Spirit is here. Take those possessions and sell them off, God, for whatever, for money, for him to get to the next place. God, do what you're going to do. We want you. Jesus, we want more of you. We want to go deeper in you. We want to understand you, your authority, your power. And then live in eternally. Because we all know there's a time, each one of these blocks, we're, we're all going to see Jesus at some point. We just don't know what day. Just like the Bible says, there's a time when we're born and then there's a time when we will die. That is life. And then there's a time in the middle. And in the middle is what we're doing right now. We're living in the middle. So I would say to you, on your tombstone, if you think about it from this perspective or in your funeral, when you're finally not here anymore, what would you want people to say about you as a person of God, as a person who aligned with God? It's great if you do wonderful things in life and you're this and that and this and that, but ultimately saints, we're gonna live eternally with him, eternally. And only the things you do for Christ will last. So that's my time. Elder Fran, I'm going to turn it over to you. Praise the Lord, Elder Maji. Praise God. We thank and praise God for the word that you've brought forth today. Praise God. God is still moving on the same subject. Praise God. No matter how long we have that, that subject, you can still pull from it. You can still pull different layers, different layers from it. So I pray that everyone um, is received something um, on this day within this lesson. Uh, Brother Prince, you're still on. Uh Father, we want to thank you for this day. This is a day that you have made. Um, we will rejoice and be glad in it. We want to thank you for the message that was sent, for, sent forth. Yes. Sir. Your word said that you, your words will go out. It will accomplish that what it set out for. It will not come back null and void to you. Father, we thank you for the speaker. Father, we thank you for everyone that was in this service tonight. Lord, and I pray that these words that were spoken fell on good soil Amen. and not on stony soil, not on the soil with thorns, not on a rock, and give us a heart, a heart to serve you and a heart to be humble and stay in your word. And we thank you for everything that you have done. And as we go our separate ways, let us always remind ourselves that it is you who is our head, you are our anchor, you are our shield. You are our comforter. You are our sustainer. And we thank you for everything that you continue to do in our lives. And I pray that you bless us and keep us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother.